Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Ralph Skein, who is our next speaker, was called to the Bar of Ontario in 1957 and awarded the Bronze Medal. He has combined practice with the Lear of Academe. He practiced law in Ontario from 1957 to 1962 and again from 1964 to 1967. Before, during, and after that period, he taught at the University of Western Ontario at Osgoode Hall Law School and at the Faculty of Law of the University of Toronto. He has since 1969 taught at that last school and taught the subjects of property and wills and trusts and was associate dean from 1969 to 1973. Appointed Queen's Counsel in 1977, Professor Skane is a member of the executive of the wills and trusts subsection of the Ontario branch of the Canadian Bar Association and a member of the editorial board of the Estates and Trusts Quarterly. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Skane. Ladies and gentlemen, notwithstanding the general title of this program, <clears throat> there is quite little that is really new in the area that I've been asked to talk about. If there are changes, I suspect they're coming through more interstitially in general attitudes of courts. But the old problems are just as difficult as they ever were. And of course, we're still awaiting the report of the Ontario Law Reform Commission on trust law which may see some development in this area as in many others. But let me start with the general topic of delegation of their powers by trustees. Here in Ontario, that power is more restrictive or appears more restrictive than is presently the case in England, where statute widened those powers or appears to have widened them very considerably since the Trustee Act 1925 was passed there. So we'll start here with the principle that a trustee, since he himself is a delegate of powers from the set law, cannot in turn delegate those powers to another. Now I immediately qualify. Practical necessity requires that even at common law, some delegation be permitted because you just can't apply that principle uh, as a matter of strict doctrine. And in particular and very limited circumstances, our Trustee Act specifically gives limited powers of delegation. And of course, the instrument of trust itself can do so. But I will be talking principally, of course, in terms of what happens or what your situation is where you haven't got specific powers in the trust instrument. So let me start off then with the problem of delegation to third parties other than co-trustees. I'll start with this proposition, that if a trustee has not committed a breach of trust by delegating some of his functions to be performed by an agent, and if he has not committed a breach of trust by appointing an improper agent or by failing to give his agent proper supervision, the trustee will not be liable to the beneficiaries for loss caused to the trust estate by the negligent or dishonest acts of the agent. Now obviously I've begged a lot of questions in that proposition. And the first of these is whether the particular act of delegation is in fact a breach of trust because the function which is purported to be delegated is one which in the eyes of the law the trustee was not at liberty to delegate. Now the general test that we will apply in these situations is that found in Spate and Gaunt. And that held that if the function delegated is one which a prudent man of affairs would delegate to an agent in the ordinary course of business, then the trustee may delegate it. But like all general tests, you can't take that at face value. It's really a corollary of the more general rule as to a trustee's standard of conduct that he will use such diligence in the execution of his office as would be exercised by a man of ordinary prudence in the conduct of his own affairs, or perhaps in Ontario, as Madam Justice Wilson has pointed out, in the conduct of the affairs of other persons. Now, that general rule, then, has been qualified that by pointing out there are certain things which an ordinary prudent person may do in the 
conduct of his own affairs, which a trustee may not do. Traditionally, things like introducing speculative elements into his investment portfolios, or maintaining investments which do not maintain an even hand between successive beneficiaries. And similarly, there appear to be certain types of functions or powers which courts expect trustees to exercise for themselves and not to delegate to other persons under any circumstances. Now, in his book on trust law in Canada, Professor Waters called these things policy decisions. And to me, that seems to be about as good a definition as you're going to get to them. Uh, they seem to defy precise categorization, but some things that might come up are how you exercise distributive powers under a trust whether you should dispose of or conversely acquire certain types of assets for your trust, what types of assets you need to hold for this particular trust that you're administering. All of those things seem to be examples of things which traditionally the courts are going to say you should, if you are the trustee, you should do or decide yourself, not turn over the decision to someone else. And if the agent purports to create rights or liabilities vis-a-vis -vis third parties, with respect to some matter uh, of which he should not have delegated authority, then the act of his delegate may be void or voidable, depending on the circumstances, at the instance of the beneficiaries, which exposes the trustee to liability to the third parties, and if loss has occurred to the trust estate, to the beneficiaries themselves. Well, let us assume that the particular function is one in which delegation is not forbidden on principle. That is, it is theoretically delegable. Then, according to our general test, if the prudent man of affairs would delegate that function to an agent, we can go on to the next step. When considering delegation, prudent men of affairs are careful as to whom they select as their agents. They're expected to use care in choosing agents of good repute and to entrust agents only with functions which are in the ordinary course of business of the agent selected. And the prudent man of affairs, once he has selected a proper agent, is very careful to supervise that agent, at least to a reasonable degree within the, his ability to do so. Now, all of these things then or breach of any one of these expected obligations can impose liability on the trustee. And at this point, I think it's essential that we realize that the trustee, where he is being made liable in these delegation situations, at least liable to his beneficiaries as distinct from some liability to third parties, is not being made liable vicariously to his beneficiaries for loss flowing from some act or omission of his agent. Is, as, for example, is the owner of a motor vehicle for the torts of his driver. Where the trustee is being made liable, he is being made liable for his own default, not for the default of the agent. The default of the agent may be the triggering thing that causes the loss, but what the trustee is being made liable for is either putting the affairs in the hands of an agent at all, where he shouldn't have done so, or picking the wrong agent under the circumstances, or having picked the right agent, not watching that agent carefully enough so as to be able to cut down, either prevent or mitigate a loss. Now, we have to keep that distinction between direct liability for the trustee's own defaults and vicarious liability in our minds, I think, when advising trustees or when structuring cases for or against them. And certainly, we have to keep it in mind when we are considering certain statutory provisions which may be relevant in delegation situations. Now at this point, I'd like to go out on a frolic of my own and to contemplate a potential delegation problem where we badly need some more guiding jurisprudence. And that's the field of investment decision making. Now here we're in an area where we can anticipate that the courts are likely to find that the trustee should not delegate his decision making functions at all as distinct from the implementation functions of brokerage, etc. Now certainly that's the early 19th century English view. Maybe we can infer it, if one wants to stretch a point, from fairly recent decisions of the Court of Appeal and Smith, maybe. However, 
situations in this area shade from one to another. And what bothers me about the area is that differences in form obscure very great similarities in substance and perhaps get us to results in different situations, in which I, for one, find considerable difficulty in accepting any right that there is any rational grounds for. Let me pose to you a situation where a trustee with funds to invest is considering the following vehicles for investment. A Limited, which is a conglomerate limited company, uh, carries on manufacturing, distribution businesses, and also spends quite a bit of its executive time and its assets in acquiring control of other companies. If I were thinking of one of the air, I'd think of something like Litton Industries. B Limited is another one. That's a large holding company which doesn't run any enterprise itself. It simply invests usually for control or a control block in other companies. Argus, power, all right? C Limited, which is all a closed-end investment company, limited form, doesn't operate any enterprise itself, maintains a portfolio of investments in a number of other companies, often within the same industry or group of industries and it shifts those investments around as analysts see proper. It'll usually go more for diversification than control. Now we come down to another one. D Trust Company's Equity Trust Fund. This is an open-end investment trust in which the investors purchase participation units representing fractional equitable interests in the assets held by the trust company as trustee. It doesn't have to be a trust company, of course, and often they aren't. Those investments the trustees, professional analysts, shift around as they see fit. And finally, one more on our ladder, E Company. E Company is a well-regarded member of the Toronto Stock Exchange and investment dealer and has a well-regarded investment analysis department, at least if you believe their television ads. Now, under, under, this, circumstance, under this particular service, the client will typically put the company in funds, it'll give general policy directions to the company and give the company authority to buy and sell. The company will then buy, sell, and hold in its own name, usually, the securities, the ultimate securities it buys for the client, and it will agree to keep those securities held in a segregated form for each client and account to its client for them. Essentially, that company <coughs> is becoming a trustee for the investor. Now, assuming respectable performance records for each one of these vehicles, a prudent man of business might very well choose any one of them as a proper vehicle for his own capital. Our trouble is that the restrictions on the ability to delegate would appear to prohibit the prudent trustee from exercising the same range of choice among those vehicles unless there is clear express authority given to him to use at least some of them. <clears throat> now, with respect to the first two, the big conglomerate type company and the holding company that gets into control, and probably with respect to three, the closed end investment limited company, I don't think any of us would ordinarily think in terms of a delegation problem at all with respect to trustee investments. Indeed, assuming that they meet the performance requirements of Section 27 of the Trustee Act, common shares in these vehicles, or PREF shares, would appear on their face to be authorized trustee investments for at least a portion of the trust fund. Yet if you think about it, in each one of those circumstances, while the trustee investing in the company is exercising his choice as to what company to invest in, exercising discretion as to a choice of his vehicle. And also, of course, whether to remain with that choice down the road. He is delegating to others the entrepreneurial choices which will ultimately govern the yield and the capital worth of his investments. Unless, of course, his investment is sufficient to give him control of the vehicle. Now, the range of the entrepreneurial choices that are being delegated uh, will vary between the companies, but there are very great similarities. A, we said, was uh, carrying on its own business enterprise. B and C exist only to invest in other companies. B will probably to concentrate on control. C, probably to diversify. But in doing, carrying out their functions, 
All those companies are doing the same things as an ordinary trustee must do in their decision-making capacity, deciding what and when to buy and sell. <laughs> now, going down the ladder, or up the ladder, depending upon your viewpoint, the functions performed by C Company, which is our closed-end investment limited company, and D Trust Company's trust fund are identical. Only the form in which the investor holds his right of participation in the enterprise differs. With C Company, of course, the investor is holding a legal fractional ownership in the company, and the company in turn holds the assets. With the trust fund, the investor, our, tr our trustee investor, holds an equitable fractional investment in the investments in turn held by the trust fund. So that when the managers of the trust fund are selling one investment and buying another, they are dealing with assets which inequitably, in equity, are fractionally owned by our investor. When the managers of companies A, B, and C, the three limited companies, do the same thing, they are not dealing with an asset in which our investor has any direct proprietary right, legal, or equitable. Now, as we move from the third one, the closed-end investment limited company, to the fourth one, the trust company's participating trust fund, we clearly are leaving investments which may be authorized by the Trustee Act, and we then have to rely upon certain wider authority conferred by the trust instrument if the investment is to be authorized at all. But unless the instrument expressly confers authority to use an open-end investment trust as a vehicle, or if you're contemplating the management broker service, unless it expressly delegates or gives authority to delegate the power to decide on the acquisition and disposal of investments and to allow the investments to stand in the name of a third party, we are on very dangerous ground because the problem of delegation is no longer hidden behind the corporate facade and it may loom much larger in the court's eyes. Now, many of the U.S. jurisdictions have considered it wise to solve this problem by enacting statutory provisions to authorize investments of this nature. Strangely, most of these statutes have specifically authorized investments in the closed end investment limited company, or types B and C, which indicates that even in that type of vehicle, the delegation function has been of concern in American jurisdictions. Now, as we move into the open-end investment trust area, the delegation aspect becomes even more obvious. And as we go on to the management broker, it's more obvious still. The trustee investor who turns over his funds to e-company to manage, quote and unquote, under the conditions that I have stipulated for, as to how e-company holds the shares, has, in a sense, very much the same type of interest as he has in the participation units he may buy in the trust fund situation. He holds an equitable interest in the investments bought with his money because I have postulated that there is a trustee situation or subtrust situation growing up. Only here, he owns the entire equitable interest. Now, the trouble is this vehicle emphasizes even more the agency aspect of the relationship, because should he wish to assert it, our trustee investor has the ability to control the ultimate investments, which is missing in our other examples. In addition, as I mentioned, in using the services of the management consultant broker and letting the shares stand in the broker's name for trading convenience, the trustee investor is committing another grave sin under trust doctrine traditional doctrine anyway, because he is leaving outstanding in the hands of third parties the trust or the title to trust assets, which he has the means to and is under a duty to call in to his own hands. Now, at the point where we move from the trust company fund to this management consultant, uh, investment management consultant trust sort of thing, I think even the lay investor starts to sense a difference. A man who invests in our D Trust Company's fund is likely to say to himself or to other people, I've got my money invested in trust fund units. The man who invests through our managing broker 
and that subtrust is much more likely to say, I've got my money invested in railways and banks or whatever the ultimate investments made on his behalf by that broker may be. Now, with this in mind, let's just assume for a moment that our investment trustees are operating under a wide investment clause, as they have to be, of course, to get into this type of investment anyway, that permits them to make any investments which in their uncontrolled discretion they consider advisable, whatever the uncontrolled means, according to Professor Cullity. Well, our particular problem, really, from the point we're discussing now, is to determine whether a trustee who is acting under such a wide clause, who employs any one of the vehicles that I have mentioned, is at risk if the investment goes sour, merely because he has not, quote, made, close quote, the, quote, investment, close quote, himself but has turned that decision over to someone else. Now, at least up to four, the Open End Investment Trust, I think the perception is that the unit of ownership actually purchased by the trustee, whether it be a share in a limited company or a participation unit in the trust, is the investment which the trustee has made within the wording of the wide investment clause. I think that's a strong perception. But when we get to situation five, we stripped the agency aspect, which is in all of these situations, of the camouflage, which in varying degrees has covered it. Now, my own submission is that the mere fact of delegation of part of the decision-making process should not of itself place a trustee in a position of breach of trust in these investment situations and that the proper response of the courts would be to make an application of the rule in spate and gaunt as a more sensible reaction to the problems that a trustee faces acting under a wide investment clause when he is faced with the sophisticated choices which are available in the modern investment market and has to achieve that delicate balance between need for income, security of capital, and protection against inflation, which is the curse of the problems of the present trustee. Now, it's quite true that the trustee can always obtain more or less sophisticated advice and then make his own decision as to whether or not to follow it. That, of course, doesn't involve a delegation problem. But in reality, I suggest that a trustee who is not himself bringing very substantial personal uh, sophistication to the problem is likely to become a willing captive of his advisors anyway. Indeed, a trustee who receives advice from respectable investment counsel may well feel that he is under greater risk of provoking attack from beneficiaries if the investment goes sour by ignoring the advice after it is tendered than he would be if he followed the advice. And I think that is a sensible perception on the part of the trustee. In that case, I suggest that in insistence on a charade of independent decision-making is not a realistic approach. So I don't think, then, that a trustee should be at risk of a breach of trust merely because he is delegated if he uses any one of these vehicles, including, and I say this with very great hesitation, even the investment managing broker, so long as he chooses them on the basis of long-established good repute, presence of professional investment analysts, past performance, stated investment policy. I think the trustee has to satisfy himself that the kinds of investments into which the delegate converts his money historically and according to current representations, if any, are the kinds of investments which are proper for his particular trust. Where he can direct investment policy is with the managing broker. He should be establishing a policy which is consistent with the obligations of trustees generally and the needs of his trust in particular. But I suggest that having done that kind of thing, he has gone about as far as he can go in keeping within his own hands those policy decisions which the courts insist should be kept in trustees' hands. Now, that done, he must then follow the second arm of the rule and police the results carefully. A prudent investor doesn't put his investments in, the in a safety deposit box and go to sleep over them for the next 20 years. You've got to make sure that performance is measuring up to expectation. 
But in so doing, he's going to be making exactly the same types of decisions as he would be if he were investing directly in the ultimate uh, investments, whether it be the Government of Canada bonds or Bell Canada or whatever. Decide to buy, decide to hold, decide to sell. And the distinctions, I think, uh, are not realistic in the present age. The delegation problem should be a non-problem. But my opinion on a $1 bill will get you four quarters when it comes to advising a trustee in this area. There's a lack of modern Anglo-Canadian authority and the concerns expressed in the decided cases and in the literature in the United States indicate that on grounds of delegation alone and on grounds also of leaving securities outstanding, the fourth and fifth ones that I've mentioned, the Open End Investment Trust and the uh, delegation to the broker under an investment uh, service are extremely dangerous courses, even with a wide investment clause. Because the trouble with the wide investment clause is that it begs the delegation question. It doesn't tell you or solve for you the problem of who is making the investment or even what the investment is in these delegation situations. So if you're going to undertake one of these situations, I suggest that you not do so without express authority in the instrument. Now, it would be very interesting, I think, if some trustees who hold a broad investment power and want to use one of these vehicles, such as an open-end investment trust or an investment management service, would ask the court to vary the trust to give them express powers to invest through those vehicles because I think we could then obtain some indication of the Supreme Court of Ontario's views on the delegation problem in a modern investment context before the trustees risk an action for breach of trust. Now, I want to say just a few words about delegation to co-trustees. The governing principles here are the same as in the case of delegation to third parties. The same rules apply. Courts often, often said that they don't recognize passive trustees. So a trustee who supinely allows a fellow trustee or trustees to take over the control of the trust may be in breach of trust himself or herself because either the function delegated was one that he could not have delegated even to a co-trustee, or the co-trustee was not a proper person to take over the entire function in the sense that it was some particular type of function which you would need a special type of agent, or because, most likely, the inactive trustee was not sufficiently vigilant in supervising what was going on. And again, in these situations, the delegating trustee is liable to his beneficiaries for his own breach and not vicariously. Now, although it's, again, not strictly speaking a delegation problem, I would like to mention just a moment the problem of the minority trustee acting under a majority rule clause in a trust instrument. I don't know, I, haven't, I certainly didn't find any direct Anglo-Canadian authority. I found only one situation in the time I had in which the problem would come up in a U.S. court. Now, on principle, one would expect to find, or at least I would, that a trustee in a minority position who believes that an action proposed by the majority may result in a breach of trust, cannot protect himself merely by casting a dissenting vote. Now that's the position taken by the one U.S. case which I found directly on point. A trustee who finds himself in that position should move for the advice and direction of the court quickly. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, I'm saying every time you disagree, you move for the advice and direction of the court. I'm saying where you think that there is a situation where the actions of the majority may lead to a breach of trust, if you happen to be right in your suspicions and you have taken no active steps you are in to bring the matter to the attention of the court, you are in peril. There is no reason, I think, to assume that the presence of a majority clause relieves any trustee of his duty to give independent consideration to the issues arising in the administration of the trust and to take reasonable care that a breach of trust does not take place. Now, the majority acting on such a clause may be able to bind the trust estate against third parties, that matter, but that's an entirely different issue. Now, 
I'd like to spend just a few moments on the intervention of our statute into this situation. We've got Section 20 of the Trustee Act, which provides that trustees are authorized to appoint solicitors to receive and give discharges for property receivable by the trustee and solicitors or bank managers to receive, give discharges for money payable under a policy of insurance or otherwise. I don't know what or otherwise means. I argue that it is eustem generis. But note that all under, this, under this section, although it authorizes delegation in the limited circumstances specified, the section gives no protection to the trustee if he leaves the money once collected by the solicitor or bank manager in the control of the solicitor or banker any longer than necessary to transfer them back to the trustee. In such a case, if loss results, the trustee is under back to his common law position and will probably be nailed under traditional law at least for leaving assets outstanding which he ought to be bringing back into his own hands. Now the more important section is section 33. That section says, and I'll just read parts of it, a trustee is chargeable only for money and securities actually received by him, notwithstanding his signing any receipt for the sake of conformity, and is answerable and accountable only for his own acts, receipts, neglects, or defaults, and not for those of any other trustee, nor for any banker, etc., with whom any trust monies may be deposited, nor for the insufficiency or deficiency of any securities, nor for any other loss unless the same happens through his own willful default. I'll stop there. That seems on its face to be a pretty broad section. It is my suggestion that we must apply it cautiously. It may not give the protection it seems to on its surface. It goes back to English legislation of 1859 and appears to have been introduced because at that particular time express clauses of that nature were appearing in the trust instruments. At least prior to 1930, this section appears to have been regarded in England as simply codifying the existing law. It only applies in the circumstances it sets out. The words, or any other loss, are not given, or have not been given by the English cases, a wide interpretation. And where it's talking about receipts of money or deposits of money in the hands of bankers, brokers, etc., the courts have said that means properly deposited. That suggests that the rule in spate and gone, it's reasonable, it's regular tests are being applied by the courts. The entrustment of the money to the hands of the agent must have been proper in all the circumstances. A reasonable man must have been in a position where he would have entrusted it under the circumstances. Otherwise, you aren't going to get the protection. Now, the section, I think, emphasizes the fact that the trustee is being made liable for his own default and not vicariously liable for the faults of others. I don't think it changes that basis of liability. It may change the standard of care through the limitation of liability to willful default. And that's a matter that is of considerable discussion in the literature, particularly in England. Now, certainly in the old cases, the courts appear to have treated that phrase, whether they were appearing in instruments or as a phrase used to describe the general liability as trustees as including ordinary negligence or want of ordinary prudence or some of those other phrases the courts like to use. In 1931, however, in the Vickery case, uh, was decided by Mr. Justice Maugham in England, and that case generated a lot of comment in the literature, surprisingly little in the law reports. Now, much of the commentary has been directed to a point which we don't have to worry about, at least as yet in Ontario, uh, of one section of the English Trustee Act which apparently greatly broadened the ability to use or delegate your functions to agents without the restrictions of the common law rule on spate and gaunt. And that section is not present in our legislation. But the case may have major importance because of what was said about the interpretation of the words willful default in the English equivalent to our section 33. And Mr. Justice Maugham applied what has sometimes been called a, sort of a variation of the Darien Peak test. He said that a person is not in willful default 
unless he is conscious of the fact that he is committing a breach of duty or is recklessly careless whether his act or omission is a breach of duty or not. Now, the court was following decisions on cases involving construction of instruments in company articles, and the decision has been certainly challenged. It was followed many years ago by Mr. Justice Kelly in an Ontario case called Brown and Brown, but he held the trustee liable nonetheless. Now, that decision was reversed in the Court of Appeal, but it's not clear from the very brief note of the judgment of the Court of Appeal whether or not the court was giving its approval to the Vickery test. Now, I suggest that Section 33 of the Act neither broadens the rules worked out by the courts as to the right to delegate, nor removes the obligations created by those rules to make a proper choice of the agent and to supervise that agent. If the test in Vickery is correct, it reduces the standard of care to be applied dramatically. And the very size of the reduction of the standard of care, I think, should make us cautious in relying upon that broad definition of willful default. Section came into our act very early in 1865, following the English Act. At that time, there was certainly no suggestion in the cases of literature that the phrase willful default had that wide ambit. And there is no section in the Ontario Act, as there is in the English Act, which also protects uh, trustees from defaults of agents appointed in good faith. And it's been suggested by some commentators that willful default has defined in revickery aids in reconciling those phrases in the English Act, but that's not a problem we have in our statute. Also, of course, in these situations, the delegation six situation, section 35 may come into play. That's the one Professor Cullody referred to. Uh, which enables the courts to exonerate a trustee or relieve him from liability if he has acted honestly and reasonably. That's a last resort section, and it, of course it doesn't operate until a trustee is in breach of the first place. But delegation situations are obvious situations where you can consider the application of that section. Now, Mr. Fuller, in his instructions to me, very much asked me to cover the law of trusts as I laid the letter in 45 minutes. I obviously can't do it. I have, in the printed materials, said a fair bit about the duty to account. I have not been talking about passing of accounts, and I have not been talking about duty to account in the sense of duty to account of, for profits made at the expense of the trust. But uh, just in the few moments before the pangs of hunger cause you to revolt, Trustees are under a duty to maintain comprehensible accounts, keep them up to date, and act, uh, I think, allow any beneficiary of the trust to examine those accounts. I'm suggesting that the stronger line of authority is the trustee doesn't have to supply copies, certainly at his own expense, although you will find in Professor Waters' book and in some of the English texts, authorities which appear to say the contrary. The courts appear to expect the trustee to act reasonably, consider the balance of convenience of preparing the accounts, how much trouble is involved, how much trouble is involved for the beneficiary, and a court might well conclude in certain circumstances that a trustee who refused to give a copy, say, to a beneficiary at some considerable dis distance was acting unreasonably in the face of the strong imbalance of convenience. Now, there's a pretty wide approach taken by the courts as to who is a beneficiary for the purposes of this rule. Certainly beneficiaries having contingent interests are so entitled, and Irish courts have held that even those within the purview of very wide discretionary trusts have the right to inspect the account. Now I think theoretically that could become a pretty difficult burden on trustees especially, I suppose, in these days of political action, we have to contemplate that uh, someday somebody will try to prove a point by sending 5,000 people under a pension plan and one by one into the trustee's office to inspect the accounts. Uh, I suggest only before Mr. Clafferton faints uh, that there's ample power in the court to protect a trustee from vexatious harassment of that nature. I do want to mention just for a moment the fact that attempts in the trust instrument that the trustee need, or to provide in the trust instrument, 
that the trustee need not account to the beneficiaries have generally been ill-fated. Firstly, such attempts immediately raise the issue whether the gift in question is really a trust gift at all or a gift to the beneficial interest. And where it is a gift on trust, notwithstanding that attempt, certainly the American courts have tended to dis disregard that clause as offending public policy, at least insofar as it purports to keep the trustee or protect the trustee from accounting in an action brought against him in the courts. One English case where such a clause was inserted, the court treated it merely as ancillary to a clause giving discretion to the trustees and said that it protected the trustee against an allegation that he had not made reasonable expenditures, but that it did not restrict him from his obligation to account for what in fact he did, ex he did expend. And a quite recent Canadian case in British Columbia held that a clause in a pension trust agreement which purported to exonerate the trustee from accounting to anyone other than the set law, the employer, employing federation in this case, was void on public policy grounds in a, as an attempt to oust the jurisdiction of the court. Myself, I say hooray to that type of decision, although I don't suppose that I will receive unanimous assent. I think the courts are right in being antagonistic to those clauses. Trusts are creation of the courts. They exist only on the court's terms, not the settlor's terms. Although, of course, so long as the settlor's terms are acceptable to the court, then they can prevail. And perhaps the most fundamental doctrine of trust law is that there can be no trust whose administration the court cannot control or if maladministered, reform the maladministration. I can't myself think of anything more basic to this power of control than the ability to obtain an accounting of the disposition of the assets under administration. The courts don't act of their own motion, so I suggest that even an attempt to restrict the beneficiaries from seeing the accounts without even first bringing an action is a serious impediment to the proper functioning of the court's supervisory rule over trusts because it is the beneficiaries who will ultimately have to activate the court's supervisory role. Now, I'm going on, or will go on in the published paper to discuss the duty of the trustee to supply information other than the strict accounts in the accountant's sense of the word. Basically speaking, the beneficiary is entitled to know what the investments are, where they are, and I think even to see them to make sure that the trustee actually has those bill certificates that his accounts say he has. Whether he is entitled to examine the trust documents is another question. I discussed that in a discussion of the very recent and well-known English case, the Earl of Londonderry Settlements. But if I launch on that, the cook will get mad, Mr. Collins-Williams. So if you will excuse me, I'll leave that for the published paper. Thank you very much.